This is Sunday, the 10th of February, 2013. And we begin a new study this morning, having just completed the miracles of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it seemed fitting and proper and opportune to look at the parables of the Lord Jesus. Um, it is difficult once you have the opportunity to look at the Lord Jesus in His earthly ministry at first hand, speaking the red ink in the Gospels to leave and go do something else. And uh, this is an opportunity to focus, uh, as we did first, on His works. Now we will focus on His words. And uh, roughly a third of Jesus' teaching in the Gospels, a third of your red letters, uh, is in parable form. So that will be our uh, study beginning this morning. And we'll take a moment at the outset to go to the Lord in prayer, and then we'll begin. Father, what a privilege it is to spend time together uh, with distractions set aside, with the pressing cares and responsibilities and requirements uh, momentarily in abeyance so that we can spend uh, time in fellowship and in uh, focus and attention on the truth of your word as we think about it together, as we look at it together, as God the Holy Spirit ministers it to our hearts and we receive the blessings that come from our contact with one another, the ministry gifts that you've given uh, and distributed in our midst and each one can not only be blessed but also be a blessing to others. We thank you for this privilege. We thank you for the Lord Jesus, who is the uh, reason that we have these privileges and these opportunities. It's through his work on our behalf in not only uh, dying for us and paying the penalty for our sins, but entering us into relationship with you and a special relationship at that, one that is unique in history, uh, is reserved especially for us and we know that we are your gift to him as his body and bride and we hope to be a glorious church without spot or wrinkle or any such thing but holy and without blemish when he returns to receive us to himself we pray that our study this morning and in the weeks ahead will contribute to that goal that we will be convicted that we will see those places where we can change our minds and be encouraged be uh, compelled, uh, be sensitive to the leading of your Holy Spirit and become those people that you have called us to be in this life as we prepare for the age to come. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. It's an interesting uh, task to begin a study of parables because there are so many different ways that you can start. You say, well, why don't we just do them chronologically? Try to find the first one and just go all the way through. But there, it's a bit problematic because the Gospels are not always strictly chronological and so you don't necessarily know which one came first and there doesn't seem to be any particular um, rhyme or reason to doing it that way. It's, it reminds me a little bit of the Proverbs where you can go to Proverbs and just crack the book open in the middle somewhere and start reading it. It just seems like, well, you know, here's a guy with his crumb on the rooftop and then here's somebody out in a field and here's somebody with a proud look and a lying tongue and here's these six things that the Lord hates and it just seems to jump around from hither to yon. And if you just go parable to parable uh, in that fashion, trying to do it chronologically, uh, they don't hang together very well and there doesn't seem to be a, a flow. As is always the case, it is context that helps us uh, in sensitivity to the purpose of the parable. Jesus didn't just pop out a parable every few hours because that's what he was supposed to do. They were in the context of his ministry, in the context of where he was and to whom he was speaking and what issues needed to be addressed. Sometimes they were in response to a question or in response to an issue that is raised. So let me first of all begin by giving a bit of an introduction and this is not uh, material that's unique to me. Uh, I, in fact, as I looked around at, at some of my reference materials and, and looked elsewhere, these are, these are fairly common observations that, that are uh, not anybody's 
domain or purview, but they are very helpful. The, in other words, these are commonly understood things, but we're going to review them because uh, they may not be fresh in our minds. Um, when you look at uh, critical scholarship and people say, well, I don't think Jesus really said that. I don't think he really did that. I'm not sure he really... Uh, the only thing I'm going to say in regard to those folks is even they believe that the parables are probably authentic to the historical Jesus. They may disagree about his deity. They may disagree about uh, his miracles. But when you get the people that did the quest for the historical Jesus and started, you know, doing the Thomas Jefferson thing to their Bible and saying, well, this isn't real and this isn't authentic, you know what they always leave in is the parables. And what this tells me is there is such an undeniable divine truth in those parables that even the naysayers, even the, the screwed up people realize these things are unique. There's nothing like them. Human wisdom could not arrive at the, the depth and the beauty of these uh, teaching tools that the Lord Jesus used. And so anybody who recognizes anything authentic about Jesus, the first thing they'll say must be him is the parables. So, um, all of the great themes of his teaching are addressed in these. Uh, foresight, looking ahead, how are you going to live your life and what is your goal? Um, you think about the, the man with the houses and, and barns, and this night your soul is required of you. Or you think of the, the foolish servant who didn't anticipate his master's return. You think of the talents or the minas. You think of so many parables where Jesus encourages people to look ahead. Think about the consequences. Don't just live in the moment. And this is one of the primary themes of his preaching and teaching. As he says, repent for the kingdom is at hand. Look ahead. Are you prepared for the kingdom? Have you prepared yourself for God's presence and, and the future with God. So, because they encapsulate and illustrate and in very pungent and direct terms communicate these great themes of Jesus' teaching, they're a great place to see the mind of the Lord Jesus revealed. His wit, His heart for his people, his love for his heavenly father, his love for us, his desire for people to understand and come to faith and obedience and into inheritance. All of these things are really wrapped up in these parables. So these, along with the Beatitudes, are probably the most famous unbelievers that don't know anything of the Bible will often know some of the parables. Uh, because they are so uh, well known. And uh, the, your church lectionaries and uh, prayer books and things that have been uh, made by the, the Episcopalians and the Catholics and so on, you know, they've got daily readings and, and it's always excerpts. Well, you don't typically find the begats or some of the more obscure things, but every single one of Jesus' parables is included in the, in the lectionaries. So... All different denominations recognize their value and their pertinence. Now, when we say parable, this but that that's introduction. This is now definition and description. Just for those of you that like a formal set of notes, I don't always announce what my points are, but I do <laughs> have a rough form of organization in them. But what is a parable? You say parable, and you say, well, that's uh, the rich man and Lazarus. That's the soils. That's uh, and, and those are the easy ones, but uh, it's interesting, if you go look for a list of the parables, list of Jesus' miracles with just one or two exceptions, uh, you, you, you arrive somewhere between 33 and 36 miracles. There's not much disagreement. There's a few places where it says, and he healed all those who came to him. Does that count as a miracle or not? Well, the, of the specific miracles, you end up with, with, with a fairly finite number. When you say, how many parables are there? Throw a dart at a number anywhere between 24 and 60. Uh, why is that? B 
because the definition of parable is not that precise. There are different kinds of, uh, of, of teaching analogies or teaching illustrations that Jesus used. Well, what are they? They're, they're going to be similes and metaphors. If he says the kingdom of heaven is like, and then he finishes it in a single sentence, is that a parable or is that just a simile? Is he, do we count that as a parable? Is that the same as one of these long stories about a sower went forth to sow or uh, a rich man lived and there was a poor man at his gate? Uh, uh, those, those span a range. So uh, we, we, these have been commonly and historically subdivided into types. And the first type is a similitude. This is the, these are the short ones. Um, the kingdom of heaven is like. Um, or which of you, having this case, would not do that? Or uh, what woman, having lost one of her coins, would not search the house to find it? Um, what king, you know, it'll start with a question, and it's just a little short uh, comparison. That's a, a similitude. It's the most concise type of uh, parable, and it's it, they always go to real life, to common experience. Um, they're generally in the present uh, tense. Tells a story that everyone recognizes. It's in a familiar realm. Um, usually in the present tense, sometimes in the past tense. Gains its persuasiveness by recounting what is widely recognized as true. No one who hears a similitude is likely to deny that the, the first part of the similitude is, is true. What woman, having lost one of her gold coins, would not sweep the house and get a light and look in every corner trying to find it? Nobody would say, well, I don't know any women that would do that. I mean, it's just the, the, the first part of the similitude is, is always widely recognized as true, almost a truism. Similitude. Um, in Luke, they often begin with the question, which of you, what woman, what king? Um, in Matthew and Mark, they often state the comparison, the kingdom of God is as if. And then you have... And uh, by one count at least, there are about 12 of these similitudes in the Synoptic Gospels. So out of the potential... 60, and I would say if you count everything where Jesus used some sort of simile, metaphor, whatever, there's, you can get up to 60 pretty easy. Uh, but there's a dozen or so that are obvious similitudes. That's, that's the first kind. Short, concise, commonly recognized truth comparison. The second one is uh, a parable proper. It, you use parable in the general sense and then you use it in the specific sense and people have decried the fact that it's used in both ways and they've tried to come up with a different word. It never works. So the second category is parable under parables general. But this is a longer and more detailed account than a simile. It's, it, it, there's more to it. It tells a story, not necessarily a commonplace of life, not some recurrent observation that everybody has, but a uh, sort of a one-time event. Uh, the parables are fictitious, but they are not fanciful or supernatural or allegorical. They're just, uh, they're true to life, but it's a specific story. Um, they are simple. They are very vivid. Uh, an example of a true parable is one we're going to look at shortly uh, from the Old Testament. If you remember the story that Nathan told David about the poor man who raised a lamb and the rich man who came and took it to feed a visitor, now that doesn't partake of a commonplace, does it? But it is a, it is a parable, it is a story that is true to life. Nobody says, well, that would, that would take a miracle for that to happen. It, it could happen. It's a fictitious story, uh, sort of a one-time event. Uh, and it's more detailed than your, than your similitude. The uh, rich man and Lazarus in Luke 16, that's a, a true parable. 
uh, the sower that sowed the seed, even though seed is often sowed, these four cases of the different kinds of soil that it falls on and the birds and so on, that's, that, that is really a, a true parable and it's extended so it wouldn't be a similitude. Um, there's uh, about 16 of these longish true parables in the uh, Synoptic Gospels. The third kind of parable is an exemplary story, an example. This presents an implied comparison between an event drawn from life and reality of the moral or religious order. The distinction is that a similitude or a parable presents an analogy between two different things. Um, the kingdom of God is compared to a seed, you know, a mustard seed, or a tree, or uh, the, 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 the lost people of Israel are compared to sheep that the shepherd has to go out and find. The exemplary story is not really an analogy of that nature where you're going, you know, that distance. It's an example. It's a specific case that illustrates a general principle. For example, the, the story of the Good Samaritan. What is the point of the, of the Good Samaritan story? Well, Jesus is answering the question, who is my neighbor, right? And so this is an example of someone being a neighbor. So it isn't, it doesn't travel the distance of a metaphor or a simile where, where they are two unlike things. It's an example of the very point Jesus is making. The uh, story that Jesus told of the Pharisee who, who prayed and said, Lord, I thank you that I'm not like other men and I'm not a sinner, and look at all these great things I've done, and there was a tax collector standing there beating his breast saying, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. The, the story is a direct illustration of the truth Jesus is, is communicating. And so that's your, uh, your exemplary story. Jesus did not invent, this is a new point, Jesus did not invent the parable form. Uh, and because of that, it wasn't an innovation. It was something that the people in his generation should have understood. It wasn't like, wow, what kind of man is this that tells these analogous stories and puts out these metaphors and similes and similitudes and parables? I, I don't get it. I can't understand. It wasn't that they couldn't understand because the form was new to them. The form was quite old. It's been used, you know, uh, Aesop was hundreds of years before the Lord Jesus. And uh, the Aesop fables are basically parables. Um, I, I grabbed two quick examples of Aesop fables just in case you've forgotten those. Uh, Aesop has a story of the bundle of sticks. An old man on the point of death summoned his sons around him to give them some parting advice. He ordered his servants to bring in a bundle of sticks. And he said to his oldest son, break that bundle. So the son grabs it and strains, but with all his effort he can't break the bundle of sticks. The other sons also tried, none of them was successful. The father says, untie the bundle and each of you take a stick. When they had done so, he called out to them, now break. And each stick was easily broken. You see my meaning, said the father. You know, there's strength in unity. And if you've got a big problem, break it into smaller parts and solve the smaller parts. It's a, this is a, a parable form. Sadly, it's, it's all at the human level. And if you have any sensitivity in your soul at all, you can read Aesop's fables and you read the parables of Jesus and you just sense that there is a, a, an altitudinal difference. Uh, human fables always operate at a human level and reflect human wisdom or human truths. Uh, Aesop had another story. Uh, two gamecocks were fiercely fighting. Uh, you know, two roosters in the farmyard are fighting to see which one's going to be the, the cock of the walk, the, the dominant rooster. I had chickens. I had a couple of roosters, and, and they do this. And it's, uh, they fluff up their neck feathers and, you know, put on a display, and then they start pecking each other and uh, it can get it can get serious if they're 
if they're really got their dander up. But these two roosters are fighting in the farmyard. One of them finally chased the other one off, humiliated him, and he went and skulked away and hid in a corner. The conqueror fl flew up to the top of the, of the chicken coop and was fluffing his feathers and crowing about his victory, flapped his wings and crowed. An eagle sailing through the air pounced on him and carried him off in his talons. The vanquished rooster immediately came out of his corner and ruled with undisputed mastery over the rest of the hens. Uh, you know, pride goeth before destruction is kind of the idea there. But this, these are Aesop fables, but you, you see the parable form, right? And you also see that these are sort of human wisdom truths uh, because there's, there, there's some lacking element in those that, that you just sort of sense. But this is not a new form. Uh, next point, if you're numbering them, if this is next point. Uh, there were Old Testament parables. And this is one of the reasons that Jesus used this form is he knew people who were already familiar with it. And uh, there's uh, Balaam used one in uh, Numbers chapter 23. Uh, you remember the famous one in Judges 9 where uh, Jotham talks about uh, the trees are electing a king and the olive tree says no and all the other trees say no and you finally get to the thorn bush and then fire is going to break out of the thorn bush and consume all the trees. Judges 9, that's a parable. Um, the riddle of Samson in Judges 14, uh, out of the, uh, what was it, out of the eater came something to eat, something to eat and out of the uh, something bitter came forth sweet. Yeah, uh, in Judges 14. That's, that's a, a parable, and, and it also has sort of a riddle form to it, which Jesus' parables sometimes do as well. Uh, Nathan, of course, in 2 Samuel, uh, talking about the poor man's lamb to David. Um, the uh, woman of Tekoa that comes to David. You remember that, that later one at uh, Joab's behest. Um, there's a son of the prophets in 1 Kings 20 that tells the parable of the escaped prisoner. Um, Jehoash, king of Israel, talks about the thistle and the cedar in 2 Kings 14. Isaiah, in Isaiah chapter 5, verses 1 through 6, we saw that uh, parable of the vineyard and the wild grapes. Uh, the farmer preparing his fields in Isaiah 28. Uh, Ezekiel, we saw the lion's whelps in Ezekiel 14. Uh, the boiling pot in... Uh, Ezekiel 24, uh, the great eagles and uh, wine, uh, parables in Ezekiel 17. So these are ubiquitous. We saw some in the book of Job uh, in the dialogues of the four friends. There were little short parabolic uh, statements in there. So this was a known form. And... The interesting thing is what Jesus says about it in talking to his disciples. There is a twofold purpose for parables. And this, if you're making notes, is your next point. The purpose of parables, Jesus' purpose in teaching in parables. And we find him describing this or, or detailing it specifically in Mark chapter 4, verses 10 through 12. And you might turn there. This is paralleled in Matthew 13. But turn to Mark 4 first. Jesus, at the beginning of that chapter, is teaching by the sea. Great multitude is gathered. He gets in the boat, sits on the sea. The whole multitude is on the land facing the sea, the natural amphitheater. He taught them many things by parables and said to them in his teaching. Now notice, he taught them many things by parables. 
What is one of the purposes of parables? To teach. It is a teaching tool. He taught them many things by parables. Said to them in his teaching. Notice you've got teach in there twice. Teaching, teaching, parables, teach. And where there's teaching, what is the purpose of teaching? What's the purpose of teaching? Learning, right? It is not enough that there be teaching. Hear me now. Write it down. Put a star by it. It is not enough that there be teaching. You cannot get by on teaching. I cannot get by on teaching. We do not subsist. We do not succeed. We do not achieve. We do not accomplish. We do not grow. We do not inherit. We do not reflect the glory of God by teaching. It is learning. A good pastor does not study to teach. He studies to learn. He's going to be no good at teaching if he has not first learned. Anybody who teaches needs to first learn. And there's nothing more sad in our education system today than to look around and see how many bad teachers there are who have not learned their subject, who turn the students loose and say, you know, th this has become the, the paradigm now where there are unqualified teachers. We've made it so unattractive and so poorly paying and there's so little reward because parents do not invest in their children and, and prepare them for the authority of teachers so that when the teaching takes place, they learn. There are great teachers, but there aren't that many great learners anymore because children do not learn to learn at home. And people send unprepared children into the school system and the teaching has no effect because they don't know how to learn. You and I, as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, are called, we are commanded, we are exhorted, we are encouraged. The apostles plead with us, the Lord Jesus pleads with us to learn. Teaching is not enough. Learning is the key. He taught them many things by parables and said to them in his teaching, listen. Verse 3 of Mark 4. Listen. Look. You can stop right there. Look at verse 2. He taught them many things by parables and said to them in his teaching, listen. Look. Listen. Look. What is he He's practically leaning out of the boat trying to get them to learn. Then he tells the parable of the sower and the seed falling on the different kinds of ground. Then in verse 9 he says to them, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Listen, look, hear. Get something out of the teaching. Take something away from the teaching. But when he was alone, verse 10, those around him with the twelve asked him about the parable. Notice, when he was alone, but the twelve and those with the twelve are all with him. What's the, what's the definition of alone? <laughs> when he was alone, those around him with the twelve asked him. What does it mean when, that he's alone? The crowds have dispersed. The crowds have left. Who has remained? Those who are with Jesus alone. It's the twelve and a scattered set of others. The crowds have heard Jesus teach and now they have left. But there are those who are interested enough, curious enough, motivated enough to stick around. And when Jesus is alone, meaning the crowd has gone, and he's available and accessible at a personal level. When he's preaching to the crowd, he's not taking questions. Yeah, you on the 36th row back there by the rock with the little fig sprout. What's your question? These are the people who have stayed behind, right? So he's alone, meaning the crowd is gone. There's the 12 and those with the 12 asked him about the parable. That's key. How many people heard, how many people stuck around to ask about what they heard? Far smaller 
segment. Does this bring to mind anything like a wide road and a narrow road? A large group of people versus a small group of people. He said to them, this smaller, interested, stay behind, I'll delay my lunch, I'll delay my travel going back to my domicile or to my village. He said to them, to you it has been given to know the mystery of the kingdom of God. People like to say, well, this was the disciples, it was a special dispensation, they're the first popes or some such thing. It, Mark is careful to detail when he was alone, those around him with the twelve. There's more than just the twelve here, but it is a much, much, much smaller group. And he says, you who are still here, you who are still hungry, you who are curious enough and interested enough to ask the question, to you it has been given to know the mystery of the kingdom of God. But to those who are outside, i.e. not alone with me now, they're outside, they've gone. To those who are outside, all things come in parables so that. Here's a second purpose of parables. What's the first purpose? To teach so that there is learning, so that people can learn. Learn the truth of God specifically. Second purpose, so that. This is a purpose clause in Greek. Verse 12, so that seeing they may see and not perceive. Hearing, they may hear and not understand. What? I thought the purpose of the parable was so that people would understand, that they would learn. Didn't he say, listen? Didn't he say, look? Back in verse 3. So how can the purpose be that they see and not perceive and hear and not understand? I'm going to teach and they're not going to learn. That's a purpose of the parable. Now, how can that be? It's got two diametrically opposite purposes. I want you to see. I want you to hear. I want you to understand. You who are in here with me. Those who are outside, I want them to see and not perceive. I want them to hear and not understand. Why? Lest they should turn and their sins be forgiven them. Lest can also be translated otherwise. The other case, if they were not failing to perceive, if they were not failing to understand, they could turn and their sins would be forgiven. Why is it their sins are not forgiven? The other purpose of parables is judgment. It is learning, it is growth, it is understanding for some, and it is judgment for others. The very same parable hits two different people, one learns, one is judged. One changes his mind and his sins are forgiven. The other does not change his mind and his sins are not forgiven. These are the people of God now. We're not talking about salvation. We're talking about experiential walk. The same parable either blesses or judges. The same truth is either perceived or it is overlooked. Does this remind you of anything? Remember the similitude? Remember the metaphor of the Lord Jesus as a rock? The same rock is either one that you fall upon for deliverance or the rock falls on you for judgment. It's the same rock. What determines the effect of the rock? Do you turn? Do you fall upon it? Do you receive? Do you obey the Lord's injunction to listen and behold? Or do you say, well, you know, he told all those stories, but I don't really get the point. And they wander off talking among themselves. You know, he's got a really great delivery, and I, I love listening to the sound of his voice, but I didn't get one thing out of that, did you? And they, they've gone. They didn't stick around. They didn't ask. They didn't seek. They didn't knock. They didn't lift up their voice for understanding. They didn't cry out for knowledge. They didn't seek it as silver. They did not search for it as for hid treasures. Therefore, they do not understand the fear of the Lord and they do not find the knowledge of God. That's you and that's me if we stop at the point of teaching and we don't arrive at the point of learning. Now, how do we do that? 
How do we do that? You should be able to tell me the answer to this question because we have emphasized it. We've seen it over and over in our studies. Where does the learning take place? Does the learning take place right now while the teaching is going on? It takes place as you chew on it, as you meditate on it, as you explore it and think about it, as you seek the personal application in the quietude of your own prayer life before God, right? You can't learn right here, right now because I'm talking and you've got to keep up. It's later. It's after. Where does Jesus put this purpose of parables statement in Mark chapter 4? Between the teaching and the learning. The learning comes in verse 13 and following, right? He explains it after he teaches it. You and I understand and benefit from and learn after the teaching. Don't say, well, sure glad I went to class today. Now, what's for lunch? Well, I mean, you can. But at some point, we've got to revisit. Look at chapter 4. Look at the page in your Bible. Look at the first nine verses. That's the teaching. Look at 10 through 12. This is Jesus saying the purpose is that people learn, and if they don't learn, they will be judged. And then in verses 13 and following, you have the learning. Jesus explains it. What happens after Jesus leaves? Who does the explaining when Jesus goes? Who does the explaining? Jesus is gone. You can't go up and say, Lord, that was a great story, but I, didn't, I just can't figure that out. Can you elaborate on that a little bit? Who does the teaching? God, the Holy Spirit. He is the one that not only teaches, but enables our learning. What did Jesus tell the disciples in the upper room? When the Spirit comes, He will comfort you. He will lead you into all truth. You will be in the truth. You will be of the truth. You will understand the truth. You will be able to apply the truth by the Holy Spirit. Right now, they don't have the Spirit. The Spirit's not yet given. Christ is not yet glorified. Jesus does the explaining. Jesus aids the learning. That's Mark chapter 4. We're going to pause here and take our break. When we come back, we're going to see the outworking of this as we begin our and continue our study of the parables of the Lord Jesus. But let's pause here and take our break. <laughs> 